One time a person was staying at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel and he saw the actor, Robert Redford, getting into the elevator. And he ran over to him before the elevator door closed and he said, are you the, the Robert Redford? And as the elevator door closed, Robert Redford said, only when I am alone. <laughs> you know, people are their real selves when they think nobody's watching. I remember one time when I was a kid, I went to an Eagle Scout ceremony at my elementary school. And they had the guy who was becoming an Eagle Scout standing in front of the Scoutmaster. And the Scoutmaster was saying all these wonderful things about the Eagle Scout. And he has never met a person with better character. And he's never been so proud to hand out the Eagle as he was at this moment. And it was a really moving ceremony. And the young man becoming an Eagle Scout seemed genuinely moved. And I went home from that with my heart touched, thinking there are some really good young people in this world. And I was just really fortunate to see that. Well, the very next morning I went to school and I saw that new young Eagle Scout and he was in the back of a flatbed Ford truck and he was yelling and screaming and cursing and swearing. And, and I'm thinking, is that the same guy that I heard the Scoutmaster say he never had a better character that he's ever seen in his life? I'm like, that guy is not what that Scoutmaster said he was, or that's what I thought in my head at the time. And now that I've gotten older, I've come to realize that rarely are we ever the people that we want people to think we are in public. That sometimes we put our best face forward in public, but we put our real face forward in private behind closed doors where only our spouse and our kids can see us. We see that, unfortunately, in a bad way in the life of King Saul. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, you see all the good things and you think, wow, this is so touching. This guy is anointed of God. But as we read on in the story, we find out that appearances and looks can be deceiving. Let's pick up the action. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? So that was, that was a ceremonial anointing, and in a little while, the Holy Spirit's going to come on him, and that's going to be the spiritual anointing. Verse 2, when you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelza on the border of Benjamin. That's your home province, your home tribal area. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He's asking, what shall I do about my son? So that's quite a specific prediction that these women are going to come up to him out of the blue and say, Saul, the donkeys you've been looking for have been found. It wasn't like a real generic prediction, like three hours from now, you're going to meet two women or something like that. I mean, this is specific to what they were going to say. And this was to give Saul the reassurance that this was really happening, that God really was anointing him to be king over Israel. Verse 3, then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. Again, that's kind of a, it's kind of a, or, here it's kind of an ordinary sign, kind of a strange gift. You know, no box of chocolate, no pistachio nuts, no honey or whatever. We're just going to give you a couple loaves of bread. Verse 5, after that you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you'll meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres. That's kind of a handheld harp, lyre, a lyre. Timbrel, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. And prophesying doesn't just mean telling the future. It means speaking forth God's words with God's anointing. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Now, 
Just because somebody has the ability to prophesy or has a supernatural spiritual moment, that does not automatically mean that they have eternal security and they're right with God. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21? He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then Matthew 7, 22, he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And so as you read this story, knowing the, the whole Bible, you're thinking, is Saul going to be like that? Is he going to say, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Wasn't I among the prophets? And that's not what saves you. Anybody can have a spiritual moment, but it's not just how you start, it's how you finish. Have you devoted your life to following Jesus Christ? Those are the people who know Christ. Those are the people who are going to be with Christ. So just wanted to say that, you know, looks can be deceiving. Not everybody is as they appear. All right. Verse 7, once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. God is going to give you freedom to lead the people. Verse 8, go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. King Saul, who's about to become king, he needed to know that he had the support of Samuel the spiritual leader of Israel, the prophet of Israel. And he has, Saul has to wait seven days until Samuel comes to him. And this is significant because he'll do it this time, but in a few chapters when he's supposed to wait seven days for Samuel, he gets impatient and he feels compelled to offer the burnt offering without Samuel. And of course, Saul can't do that. He's a Benjamite, not a Levite, and he's going to lose his kingship over that. Although in reality, God knew that this was all going to go down anyway because he knows the end from the beginning. All right, verse 9. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. Now we should not, knowing if you just had this one little verse, God changed Saul's heart we might be able to draw the conclusion that Saul was a born-again believer in God forever with a changed heart. But the problem with that is that we know the rest of the story. We know that he had a changed heart just for a short season. He didn't have a changed heart for his entire life, for the rest of his life. But this is what happened initially. All these signs were fulfilled that day. Verse 10, when he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. And it was quite a sight, because as we saw yesterday, Saul is not known for being a spiritual person. I mean, Samuel is a spiritual superstar in Israel, and astonishingly, Saul had not heard of him. So, which gives you a hint at his lack of interest in spiritual things. So when you get to verse 11 here in chapter 10, it says, when all those who had formerly known him saw Saul prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? This is so out of character for Saul. He's not normally interested in spiritual things. He's kind of a pagan. Where did this come from? How did he get religion? Who does he think he is? And then verse 12, a man who lived there answered, and who is their father? <laughs> you know, first time I read that, I'm like, well, what in the heck does that mean? But a father was somebody who was the spiritual leader of a school of prophets. And this guy's making a snide remark. He's saying, who would be the spiritual father of a group of people that had Saul in it? I mean, this guy is so disinterested in spiritual things. I mean, how heathen would their spiritual father have to be to be the leader of that bunch? So this is meant to be kind of a, you know, a snide stabbing remark. So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? 
You know, again, there's a big difference between Saul and Samuel. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, all Israel attest, and chapter 4, all Israel attested that Samuel was a prophet of the Lord. But people are not feeling that way about Saul at this time, or really at any time. So, verse 13, after Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said, but when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, tell me what Samuel said. Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. I mean, if people don't believe that he's among the prophets, they're certainly not going to believe that he's going to be the king, the first ever king of Israel. So I could see why Saul was like, I'm not going to say anything about this. I'm, let's just see what happens first. Verse 17, Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought Israel up out of Egypt and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. I am the great God, the great king above all gods, the one true God, the one you should love, the one you should worship, which makes the next verse kind of crazy, right? Verse 19, but you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. So Samuel is telling the people, all right, because you've rejected God, God is going to give you what you ask for. A guy who is kind of a yutz, somebody who looks to have the appearance of a little bit of spirituality, but he is not a man after God's own heart. You wanted it, you got it. Verse 20, when Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. Maybe you're thinking, oh, the deck was stacked. I mean, we already knew that you know, Saul was going to be. But God orchestrated this so that there was not only a private confirmation that Saul would be king with Samuel present, but now there's a public confirmation that Saul would be king. And, and God worked it out that Saul would be the one that would be chosen. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. Verse 22, so they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, the Lord must have spoken to Samuel or to one of the prophets, probably Samuel. And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the baggage. They ran and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. A couple things to notice here. We see Saul's initial humility. This is a tall task to be the king over a people. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I'm not sure I'm, I deserve this. I'm not sure I want this. And so he was hiding among the baggage. And on the one hand, it's kind of nice to see a little bit of humility because later on he's going to be kind of an arrogant putz. But on the other side of the coin, he's hiding from an anointing of God. And, that, and that's something that we shouldn't do because Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. So while Saul shouldn't be arrogant, he shouldn't be chicken either, hiding among the baggage that he should say, you know, the, the, I, I am humbled by this, but I'm ready to answer God's call and be whoever God would need me to be and do whatever God would need me to do. That's ideally the way to respond. You know, easier to say that thousands of years later, right? Well, they saw in verse 23 that he was a head taller than any of the others. That was what Israel wanted. They wanted someone who seemed to be big and strong and powerful and can lead the nation into battle. But people are not as always as they seem to be. Well, they ran and brought him out. Verse 24, the people shouted, long live the king. 
Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. And you can go back to the Torah to read that. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20. These are the things that Samuel told Saul. I think it's worth taking a quick peek at that. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, holy cow. Word for word, Moses knew that that's what the people were going to say. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. Well, they didn't really do that. So God said, all right, I'll let you have what you want. So you can see that having what you want isn't always what is best. He must be from your fellow Israelites. And then it goes on to explain what he will should not do. Verse 15, he must not acquire great numbers of horses or make the people return to Egypt. He must not take many wives. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver or gold. And most important of all, verse 18, he is to take a copy of the Torah and make a handwritten copy of that copy because that's going to force him to read the Torah and reflect on the Torah and reflect on what God says. And so that's what Samuel is telling Saul and telling the people that Saul needs to do. So he explained the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. And maybe he was writing down stuff from Deuteronomy 17. We don't know. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah. You know, back at that time, the judges didn't have palaces or anything like that. They lived in their own homes, and when there was a national crisis, they would leave their home and go to Mizpah and rally the troops and get ready to go into battle. And that's kind of how Saul's doing this. He doesn't have a palace. He doesn't have a place. So he's just, I'm just going to go back home until they need me. Initially, that's what the original presidents of the United States did. They didn't build the, the White House until, what, 1799? George Washington just lived in Mount Vernon, right? John Adams, you know, lived in Philadelphia. I mean, they didn't have a central place where the leader lived at this time. So Saul went to his home accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. Just like my heart was touched when I saw that Eagle Scout become an Eagle Scout. But then the next day I was like, this Eagle Scout is not the wonderful person that the Scout Master made him sound like. He's kind of a, you know, when in, in a bad moment, he's kind of a, a scoundrel type of person. That's what I remember thinking as a kid at the time. And we'll see that about Saul as well. Some scoundrel said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. You know, sometimes the best thing about a person is when they're silent, <laughs> when they're not saying anything. I mean, sometimes you just got to know not to. Sometimes when you're in a situation where you're upset, no matter what you say, it's just not going to come out right. Yeah, you're farther ahead just keeping silent. And I'm sure that Saul was upset. In fact, in the Hebrew text where it says Saul kept silent, it indicates that he kept it within him. The idea is that he heard it, he felt it, but he chose not to let it out. And, you know, you got to let that stuff out before the Lord. But that, what we see here with Saul, if you just had this chapter, he looks like a pretty awesome guy. But you look at the big picture and it's like, no, this is just a temporary bright spot in a tragic life. What kind of a life will you have? Will you have temporary bite, bright spots in the midst of tragedy? Or are you going to say, no, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. I'm going to follow the Lord all the days of my life gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. I'm going to put Christ first. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to get involved in, in a church that preaches the word. I'm going to use the gifts God has given me to make a difference in the world. Them are the people that know Christ. Those are the people that are close to Christ. We know who they are by, by their fruit. 
Jesus says in Matthew 7, 19, by their fruits you shall know them. Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so let us not strive to be a Saul who gets power, but he doesn't have a personal relationship with God. Let us strive to be like Samuel that turns to God with all our heart and all our soul, and hopefully a better parent than Samuel. But Well, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We, I think we'll be back tomorrow for 1 Samuel chapter 11. I know this week, I, maybe one, I think Friday morning I've got a dentist appointment, but I got to check the calendar and see exactly when that is. But you guys have a great day, and God bless.